in fine print. See, and you once had a perception of marriage where that pretty little girl would just sit there and smile like Felicia Rashad. That was the perception. But the reality of fine print has demonstrated to you that perception and reality are two different things altogether. The perception you had of marriage and the reality you discovered about marriage are two different things altogether. And right now, that's why some of you say concerning marriage, been there, done that, and I ain't going back. <laughs> There's a major difference between perception and fact, between perception and reality. The perception you had of the church from the outside. I wish I had somebody helping me here. The perception you had of the church from the outside is a far cry from the reality you discovered on the inside. And that goes, incidentally, for all churches, lest you fall into that grass is greener trap on the other side of the fence. All churches have problems. All churches have problem people. No church is perfect. And incidentally, all mosques have problems lest you make that mistake. All human institutions have problems. Why? Because they have human beings in them. That's why. I mean, if you ever could find you a perfect church, which I guarantee you, you will not. But if you ever could find one, the moment you joined it, it would be messed up. Because you're taking some of your stuff with you. The perception of the church from the outside and the reality of a church from the inside, two different things altogether. Perception and reality are two different things altogether. The, the perception of America from the outside, land of the free, home of the brave, liberty and justice for all. The perception of America from the outside and the reality of America from the inside. Land stolen from the Indians, a nation built on the black backs of black Africans, framers of the Constitution talking freedom but walking slaveholders, racism sewn into the fabric of this country, racism sewn into the legal infrastructure of this country from the traffic court to the Supreme Court, racism sewn into the economic system of the country, racism sewn into the educational reality of this country, racism sewn into the political garments of the country, racism an integral part of the sociology, psychology, and theology of this country, racism written boldly across the history of this country, racism alive, well, and living on every level in American society, the perception of America from the outside and the reality of America from the inside, those are two different things altogether. Perception and reality are two different things altogether and the perceptions that are running rampant in this Second King 5 text are awesome in their implications. Look, look at them if you will, because I have a feeling that some of us suffer from the same set of misperceptions. Naaman, the Bible says, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man. And we automatically get the perception that Naaman was a powerful man. He, he's the commander, power. he's got the power. He, he's not an officer, he's not a commander. Look, it says the commander, power. Plus, he was in high favor with the king. Now, you know he is powerful. He's got the power. And some of us, when we see the title, the king of Aram, our perception is that that is where the real power is. I mean, we're talking throne here. The president, top dog. The buck stops here. CEO here is where the power is. But with Na neither Naaman nor the king had enough power to do anything about Naaman's condition. Naaman had a position he was commander of the army. Naaman had a position. He was in high favor, close up on, in the inner circle of and close friends with the king. He had a position. Naaman was known, verse 1, as a mighty warrior. Not a measly wimp, but a mighty warrior. You know, sometimes those hanging around the king are measly wimps. So sometimes those hanging around the president, sometimes those hanging around the CEO, sometimes those hanging around positions of authority are people who are wannabes. They, they want to be seen. They want to be recognized. They want to be important. They want to be prestigious. They ain't got nothing going for them except their wishful thinking. They just want to be somebody. Y'all gonna help me? They got low self-esteem, so they try to make themselves feel better about themselves by hanging around somebody who's high up on society's pecking order. They're, they live their lives vicariously by association. All the king's horses and all the king's men. All the president's men, nobody's flunkies, step and fetches. 
who ain't nothing but measly wimps. But Naaman, Naaman was not a measly wimp. Naaman was a mighty warrior. He had earned his reputation. He had worked hard to get where he was. He had a position, but he also, the verse says, had a condition. And the first thing this text seems to teach us is that it really doesn't matter what your position is. What really matters is your condition. You remember Nicodemus? Nicodemus had a position. He was a ruler of the Jews. But Nicodemus also had a condition. He was not saved. You remember the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8? He had a position. He was a treasurer of Queen Candace's court. The man in charge of all the money. He had a position. But the Ethiopian also had a condition. He needed the Lord. He needed salvation. He needed to be baptized. He needed unconditional love. It really doesn't matter what your position is. Scripture says what matters most is your condition. Naaman's position was that he was a powerful leader. Now that was the perception. Naaman's condition was that he was a pitiful leper. That was the reality. There is a major difference between perception and reality. And all of the perceived power that Naaman had could not do one thing about the reality of his condition. The second image in this text, the king of Aram, is also an image of perceived Power, the king, top dog. He had a position, but he could not do a thing about Naaman's leprosy. The perception was he couldn't do he could do anything he wanted to as king. That was the perception. The reality was he could not do anything about Naaman. In fact, if you skip down, look at verses five and six, you'll see that the king of Aram is also laboring under some misperceptions. First, when he hears what the Israelite girl had to say. And I love the way the storyteller lays out the narrative. I mean, it is so true to form. Back up, back up, to, back up to verse 2 and 3. Aaron Mears, one of the raids, taking a young girl captive from the land of it. She served Naaman's wife. So she said to her mistress, the girl tells her mistress, the girl tells Naaman's wife, probably gives her all the details, <laughs> the fine print. Girlfriend, let me tell you about this preacher in Samaria. I was at a crusade he did, a revival, held at the Sumerian United Church of Christ. Couldn't hardly get a seat. I mean, sister, stand in room only. This brother was awesome. The girl told Naaman's wife. Then Naaman's wife came, drip, drip. And she told Naaman, she said, Nay, nay. That's what they call him for sure. Yeah. Shanay, nay. <laughs> Let me tell you what Shakita told me. Now, I know you ain't going to want to believe this, but Kiki swears it's the truth. There's a preacher in Samaria, and all Naaman hears is drip, 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 fine print. Ran a revival at Samaria, not church of Christ, couldn't hardly get in, drip. Kiki said, we're standing room only for five nights, drip, drip, fine print. People were lying around, drip, drip. Men on the last night of the they sat all up on the pulpit, drip, drip. And Kiki said, black Hebrew, this is black Hebrew. Kiki said, Kiki said, you need to go see her preacher. Fine print, drip, drip. And Naaman went in and told the king 